Hey Ball Nation, I'm Alexi Cowan and welcome to another episode of Torch Sports. We've got a great episode for you this week, beginning with Rocky Talk, our roundtable sports analysis, and the Orange Zone, where the bold opinions are stated and feelings may get hurt. We will also highlight this week's maxims, check the weather sportscast, and introduce our new Pick 6 section, where you all can be a part of the action. Thanks for tuning in, and don't forget to follow us on our Instagram at TorchSportsUTK and on TikTok at TorchSports. Now, let's head over to Orange Zone and hear about that Vols win last week. Welcome back to the Orange Zone. I'm your host, Jackson Shock, alongside Matthew, Colton, and Zach. We've got a great one for you today, so stick with us. We start with Tennessee football. Moments after Stir the Pearl flipped the switch to initiate dark mode, Joe Milton and the Vols avenged Hendon Hooker and sent South Carolina back home. That being said, the game did not come without any losses. Brew McCoy suffered an ankle injury, which will sideline him for the remainder, remainder of this year. We wish Brew all the best on his road to recovery. But as we celebrate our recent Super Bowl win, I ask you guys, what impressed you most about the Volunteers' effort? Matt, let's start with you. Well, I talked about it last week. The biggest thing was having third down, stopping third down efficiency for the opponents, right? The defense, which was a huge problem we saw in the first few games, get two great stops, they'd get sacks, they'd just get play after play, stop after stop, and they'd come third down, they'd give up a long yard bomb, they'd give up a yard long rush. It just it was too many problems on third down. We were able to stop it. They were two for 14, I believe, in total in third down. And not to mention, you keep Spencer Rattler under 170 yards. If you would have told me Spencer Rattler is going to be held to under 170 yards before the game, I would have told you that's a recipe for success. Absolutely. Quiet night from him. Colton. Yeah, I think two positions really stood out to me. The defensive line and the running backs were just absolutely outstanding. Defensive line especially, I mean, just got all over Rattler all game. James Pierce in particular, I mean, I mean he's just absolutely incredible. I mean, nine quarterback pressures. Um, this weekend led the entire country two sacks as well um, according to PFF he's the best edge rusher in the entire SEC and I think it's easy to see that at after this performance as well running backs I talked about them last week they all need to get involved they all did in this game each had 10 carries averaged five yards a carry and each had a touchdown as well and if they all can get that involved and keep running like that I mean we, we can we can end up with a really successful season if they can show up like that every week yep and not only did Pierce do that good he won SEC defensive lineman of the week um, but I think my biggest takeaway has got to be the defense. I mean, we just showed out. And like I said last week, we rattled Rattler. And uh, sorry, Matt, I didn't really see the killer that was in uh, Spencer Rattler show out this week, but that's okay. <laughs> um, we all have our bad takes. But I think our defense really shut them down. And I think that going forward, Tennessee's new strategy is defense. We are now a defensive team. And I think more as we settle in that we're looking to be more aggressive and our – Opponents are going to be scareder, more scared to play us. Well, hold Absolutely. on, I'm not going to let that go. Go ahead. Go. Go ahead. Um, I, I personally would have rather Spencer Rattler be dominant this game as opposed to last year when you had college football playoff aspirations. Now this year when it's kind of been thrown out of the way due to the loss to Florida, I would much rather Spencer Rattler, the killer, perform well this year. So if we could flip the switch, we could. The killer beat us last year which would hint why we came in with the same mindset this year and called it our Super Bowl. Absolutely. Now, we'll let that discussion kind of ease out as we don't deal with South Bad Carolina take. until next year. Anyways, is there anything that you guys think that Tennessee needs to work on while we've got this bye week? Well, it's good to have Cooper Mays back. It's good to have a guy back that the team trusts and creates great camaraderie on the O-line. Second thing is Joe Milton is trending in the right direction. It wasn't a great game. It was a good game. But things are trending in the right, the right direction. The, the biggest thing to note is he's still not making the right read every time, but he's been better each and every game, except for that one kind of down play in Florida. But aside from that, he's running the ball more when he should. He's making the right throws. The only two things you could harp on is one, the interceptions, and, and two, just the, the reads when he's supposed to be running it and he made the pass. A lot of things to work on, but for the most part, things are trending in the right direction. Without Brew, it makes it a little bit more difficult, but we have the weapons to continue to, to be dominant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think I think Joe Milton is really the, the question mark here. I mean, our run game has been great all year long. Defense looked great in this game. As long as we can keep that momentum going forward, I mean, we should be successful in those areas. But I think Joe Milton is really the, the, the key to this season. If he, can, if he can get a little bit better, start playing, you know, at the level that we, we've seen him play. I mean, Clemson game last year was unbelievable. And this year, 
I don't know. I just think that he's, he's been better this week than he has the weeks before, but I think he's the key, and I think he's got to get a little bit better if we want to be more successful. I'm actually going to disagree with that. Yeah. I think that we can give we can give Joe a little leeway yeah. as long as we stay with the run game. With our run game being as effective as it is right now, I think we can let Joe make those mistakes. Not necessarily make the mistakes, but he's allowed more to. If we can rush for, what were we, 280-plus this game, um, I think if we just keep him on the run game, it's a good way for us to win. And then Joe can you know, throw it deep every once in a while. Um, but another thing is, with the loss to Brew McCoy, I think one of our – Receivers will have to step up and fill that position. Maybe Thornton, maybe Caleb Webb, um, and just you know we'll see with this bye week in practice, and then coming out next game against uh, Texas A&M. It sounds like both of you are kind of giving Joe Milton the benefit of the doubt. Is that fair to say? I wouldn't say the benefit of the doubt. I would say now it's more of, uh, it's now more okay for him to make the mistakes with the run game. Benefit that, of the doubt. Yeah. Okay. So why would you give? Why do you give him the benefit of the doubt? Because do you think he's, he's earned it. Because, no, I don't think he's earned it, but so I think it's it because we kind of already are in the season. And you're not going to start a freshman quarterback out. Well, why I not? Because we don't have anybody better in the locker room. Well, if you start Nico, and at this point in the season, you lose to Florida, and at this point you want to get back into the college football playoff, you want to stay as a contender. So you're saying Joe is not going to take us anywhere but Nico? No, will? I'm saying you need a miracle. And right now, Joe is not the answer for a miracle. If, if Nico were to come in and he were to be ready, and he were to be great, that would be a miracle, which is exactly what the Vols need. Who says Nico isn't ready? We're not at the practices. We're not watching Nico on the sidelines. For all we know, Nico could be ready. Look, we're just the analysts. We can just make picks and say who we think should be out there, and I'm not saying Nico should play over Joe Milton. I'm just saying the competition at the quarterback position should be a lot closer than people think. And Joe Milton should not earn the benefit of the doubt every time because the truth is he hasn't earned it. He has not had a great game all season long. He had a very good game against Clemson last year in a different location against Clemson under the lights who truthfully played terrible. That being said, Joe Milton's a great quarterback. He's got an excellent arm, maybe the best long-distance arm in college football. But can he be the reason we go to the college football playoff? I don't know. You no, need a miracle. What let's, are you let's, saying? Let's take a look forward. Let's take a look forward as we, we, we face this game against Texas A&M next Saturday, the bye week being this week. What do you think? You're mentioning kind of the questions coming to Joe Milton. He's, he's had the opportunity to prove himself. I think he did last year. But this year it seems that he's kind of been on, on thin ice after the struggles in Florida. Yep. What do you think he can do this upcoming game that will get him 100% comfortable with Tennessee? Well, I guess have Tennessee fans be 100% comfortable with his performance and with his demeanor. Well, I alluded to it earlier. It's about making the right reads. And not only does it ease Tennessee fans, but he's got a coach who's got so much faith in him. And your coach is like, I don't know if he made the right read there. I don't know if I should put him out there. If he can ease Hypo and just get some more trust in between the two of them. Now, look, I'm not there. I don't know how much trust they have. But looking at it from the naked eye, it doesn't seem like it's just at 100%. There needs to be more trust, and that comes from making the right reads, making the right plays. And, and at the end of the day, you just have the little things go right. It's the most important thing in football is you can't make the little mistakes. You have to do the little things right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. But I think that, I mean, these games coming up are, I mean, they're the hardest games we've had this season. You know, Alabama, Kentucky all coming up. We, I talked about the run game and how good they've been, but the whole offense has got to show up if we're going to win these games. Joe's really going to have to step up, and I think that's what I was talking about earlier about him being the key. You know, the, the running backs are good, but, I mean, if we play these tough defenses, these tough teams, it's going to be Joe that makes the difference here. And I think against Texas A&M, he's, he's going to have to play a little bit better than he did South Carolina. I think A&M, especially defensively, are a little bit better than South Carolina. South Carolina's defense didn't really show up in this game whatsoever. And I think, I think, we're gonna, I think he's going to be the key, and I think he's going to have to show up against A&M and improve a little bit. As you, I mean, you alluded to it earlier. This is a tough schedule coming up for the Vols in right. October. They've got, obviously, they've got this bye week to kind of welcome October in, and then they face A&M coming off an Alabama game. If they upset Alabama there, you can more than assume that they're going to be ranked. Following that, they'll have another ranked opponent in Alabama, in Alabama, searching for revenge after last year. After that, they've got Kentucky in Kentucky, which saw what they can do at Kroger Field when they are home, what they, did, what they just did to Florida. What do you guys think the Vols – are going to need to do in order to kind of retain their focus and be a great football team that they're going to have to be to win these three games? A lot of people like to talk about how every team must have a wake-up call at some point in their season in order to get back into the swing of things and just be great. This is bad as it stinks, this injury to Brew McCoy could be a wake-up call in a sense. The team's now, as 
bonded as ever. It's as bonded as ever, and uh, they have a really good chance to just go out there and now play for something bigger than themselves, bigger than just trying to go for a win. Just compete at the highest level, and you're competing for your brother who went down. So I think because of that, there is some sort of chemistry there that kind of is on the rise, and that'll help them to propel them in October. Yeah, th I mean, this could be a wake-up call for sure. I mean, the, the Bru Bruin injury is huge. I mean, he's probably our, arguably our best wide receiver. Squirrel and him are probably, you know, the two two most dominant. I'm, I'm not sure if he has the most catches, but I know bo both, both of them are big. And then I think yep. – I think someone's going to have to step up. Dante Thornton, Caleb Webb, any of those guys got to step up. But yeah, I think I think these I think these three games are really going to dictate the season. I mean, I, I could as, as as much as I want to have confidence. I mean, K Kentucky really impressed me last week, and I mean, I mean they absolutely destroyed Florida and Florida. I mean, we didn't we weren't in that game against Florida really at all. And I mean, I think we're just, we're going to have to. We played well against South Carolina. Defense played well. But, I mean, these are different animals, I think, than South Carolina. I think, I think they've really got to step up. And for us to win, I mean, we've got to play at a different level, I think. Absolutely. Zach, send us home. So, like we said last week, this was Tennessee's what are they going to do next game. Um, and I believe that we saw what they can do against a SEC opponent, against a Power 5 team. It's just who's going to take us there next with the injury to Brew McCoy? Who's going to be that next leader to show up? Can Joe rally the troops and go out there? Can Jalen Wright or... Dylan Sampson, go out there and lead us to down the path we want to go. I really think it's just going to come down to who's, who's going to step up, who's going to be that number one guy. That's going to wrap up our Tennessee talk, and we're going to take a quick break. But when we come back, we will have a look at how our Orange Zone crew thinks that the MLB postseason is going to play out. In the meantime, we've got an amazing episode of Rocky Top coming up. So Sophie Starkey is going to take it away, who I hear is making her debut. Knock it out of the park, Sophie. Welcome to Rocky Talk. I'm your host, Sophie Starkey, alongside Jordan Smitherman and Grant Porch. Let's get to it. Week four of the NFL was certainly not boring by any means, and we have quite a lot to talk about. Let's start with one of our divisional matchups of the week, Bills and Dolphins. Now, there was a lot of hype surrounding the Dolphins after week three. They put up 70 on the Broncos. They have the three fastest ball carriers in the NFL and they were one of the only three remaining undefeated teams. Then they played the Bills, who, I will add, were already fired up since it was DeMar Hamlin's first game back after his life-threatening incident last season. The Bills managed to slow down the Dolphins with their defense and put up over 40 points. Now, are the Dolphins still a big threat moving forward, or have the Bills finally cracked the code to their defeat? Jordan, what you got? Okay, so I still think they're very good, but I also think the Bills' defense is very good. And a game at Highmark Stadium in Buffalo is always going to be a hostile environment. There's always going to be fans are just going to be amped up. And like you said, they're already amped up because it was DeMar Hamlin's anticipated return. And the Broncos, when they won by 70 to 20, I mean, not that the Broncos aren't good, but the Bills are just a little bit better. Absolutely. So <laughs> I just think that set like a too high of a bar for the Dolphins. So now everyone's expecting them to score 70 points mm -hmm. every game when that was only the fourth time a team has scored 70 points in NFL history. So then I also think that Bills just have dogs just flying around the offense all the time. They have Matt Milano, the linebacker, who has had already like two or three interceptions, which is high for a linebacker. And then you have defensive linemen like mm -hmm. Greg Rousseau, Ed Oliver, and Leonard Floyd just flying around. And then you have the ever-reliable um, – Micah Hyde, who's always just holding down the safety spot. So that defense is just full of studs. And then when Josh Allen and Stephon Diggs put it together, I mean, they're hard to stop. So Absolutely. that's what I think. What you got? Well, you knocked it out of the park right there. Certainly the Allen to Diggs connection was on last week. Diggs getting three out of Allen's four touchdowns. And you've seen this Bills team transform from what they were in week one, getting tripped up by the Aaron rodgers list Jets, losing by 1.2, blowing out the Raiders, blowing out the Commanders, and blowing it out the Dolphins as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the rest of their schedule, watch out if you got to yes. play the Bills. And, that, and they, the Dolphins do another time, so we'll be interested to see what happens there. Yeah, and I also think the offense, I mean, the Dolphins' offense is just so multifaceted. Tua is in such a good system mm -hmm. for him to succeed. And, like, Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddell were only held to, like, 50 yards each. So when that happens, who stepped up? Like, the Dolphins rookie running back, Devin Achen, he had like eight carries for like 
108 yards, which is crazy. So I think if the receivers don't step up as they usually do, you can have a running back or you can have like a tight end like Jordan Smythe to step in and just help that offensive flow going. But I do think it's just more of the Bills defense just being really good. Let's talk about some of our comeback kids of the week, Zach Wilson and the Jets. They had a pretty rough start to their season with the injury to Aaron Rodgers. They're one and three. Former Jets players were actually recommending Zach should think about stepping aside, and it was not looking too good. And just a nice little cherry on top, he had to go up against two-time MVP, two-time Super Bowl champ, Patrick Mahomes, and he made it a game. The Chiefs only won by three. If it wasn't for a fumble at the end, they might have pulled through. So what do we think? Was this Zach Wilson's turnaround game, or will he revert back to his old ways in the upcoming games? Brian, what do you think? Well, if he's turning around, he's going to have to have more than one game where he performs like that. But this is a good first step. He looks like he's been getting better since we first saw him come onto the scene in the NFL. And you, when you have guys like LeBron James mm -hmm. and encouraging him after a tough loss, you know, the guys in the black and white stripes may not have done the Jets some favors at the end of the game. But it's encouraging for the Jets to see that he's developing into a better player for sure. But consistency needs to happen in order for them to get to the level they want to get to this season. I also think there's a little bit of hope with Zach Wilson because it's inspiring that you, your quarterback, your developing quarterback, plays his best game on the biggest stage. Mm -hmm. It was Monday or Sunday Night Football, Taylor Swift was in the house, and you're playing the best quarterback in the league. So I think that's definitely a sign of hope for the Jets. Absolutely. I think... Another thing about Zach, which I kind of admire, is that he takes these games really personally. He took that loss on his shoulders, even though he wasn't the only one who made mistakes. And hopefully this was a little bit of a confidence booster for yes. him in the games going forward because he played the Chiefs. He did. The Chiefs are the Chiefs, and he, he did, did pretty good. well. One of our other comeback teams of the week, and I know you will be happy about yes. this specifically, was the Titans. And I can tell you, after the previous weeks, I did not see this one coming at Me all. Either. Titans versus Bengals. Derrick Henry had a great game. But we also must account for how vulnerable the Bengals are right now. Joe Burrow and his calf injury, their offensive line is looking a little weak, and we know that this is a team built around their offense. When they don't do well, it trickles mm -hmm. into their defense. Mm -hmm. So did the Titans actually win this one, or was it just a result of the Bengals' struggles? Jordan, what do you think? Okay, so first off, I'm just so happy we finally got a win against Joe so Burrow. Mm -hmm. That playoff loss in 2022, home game, literally crushed me, still haven't recovered. But... <laughs> He was three and Joe Burrow was three and out against us, and then now we finally got a win on him, so that just makes me feel good. But I do think the Titans actually won this game mm -hmm. because they put together their most complete game of football, and for me, that's what the Titans needed to do most. Mm -hmm. It's just put a full game together because sometimes they just be like flustery, like they have one good quarter of offense, but like the rest would be bad. And like the defense, it, they would just be like so so. But like their D line this week, the Titans, they showed why they're one of the elite squads in the NFL, constantly pressuring Joe Burrow, make him be mobile on that cap that really limits his mobility. And the offense, I was amazed. Like, I have this joke where the Titans just can't score above 27 points because they haven't scored above 27 points in almost two years, and they're up 24-3 at half. But offensive coordinator Tim Kelly was dicing it up and doing a great job of mixing running the ball, which is our identity, and throwing the ball downfield, which is unlikely for us. And Ryan Tannehill was dicing it up, and then you had people open down everywhere and we were even out without one of our top receivers in Traylon Burks and then it was just Derrick Henry and Tajay Spears who was the rookie third round running back they had a good mix sometimes it's a little too much Tajay but then we also had um King Henry throw a touchdown pass he threw more than Joe Burrow so that's a plus and then special teams oh my gosh they play a part too shout out to them so Nick Folk, our new kicker who we got from the Patriots, has not missed a field goal or an extra point yet, which is amazing for the Titans. And then Ryan Stonehouse, two punts, were both inside the 20, and punts, punters are important too, so I think the biggest thing is they just put together their most complete game, and then now the next thing for the Titans is just to stack it up. But, yeah, I just think the Bengals just need some improvement, and that starts with Joe Burrow. I would agree for sure. The Titans, I, hey, a win is a win, no matter how mm -hmm. you got it. They definitely capitalize on Joe's struggles and mm -hmm. the team struggles. To finish up the NFL for this week, we have to acknowledge the one and only Josh Dobbs. He was Kyler Murray's backup for the Cardinals. He gets hurt, and then he comes in and upsets the Cowboys, who were on a 2-0 and run. People were already talking about the Cowboys going to the Super Bowl. Personally, don't agree with that one, but they were hyped up for them, and he upset them. It was awesome. 
And though he lost to the 49ers this week, they are one of the best teams in the NFL, and I think personally he performed pretty well. Has Josh finally proved himself capable of a starting quarterback position? Grant, what do you think? I don't think so. I mean, he's a guy that's not going to lose you the game, but he's not going to go out and win you the game either. You can't ignore that he had 41 pass attempts because they're just behind because the 49ers are so good. But he is improving, and he's been a guy who's been, you know, head on straight and everything mm -hmm. like that, smart guy, good for the locker room as well. So I hope he continues to do well in Arizona, but he needs to be able to take that next step forward mm -hmm. to go get the team a win mm -hmm. when they're down by a touchdown with two minutes to go. Can he be that guy? Right now, I don't think so, but he could develop into something like that. Absolutely. Sometimes a season quarterback is what you need to like mm -hmm. get through the season, but as far as starting a new season and setting new goals, he might not be the guy yet, but we certainly hope that he does great throughout the rest of the season. So we're going to switch gears to some other sports here at UT. Some quick shout outs to our girls soccer team who are in the heart of their season right now. They're four and one and seventh overall. Another congratulations to our golf team who won their second tournament of the season on Monday. Members of the tennis team wrapped up an impressive weekend at the SEC Big 12 Challenge Sunday, noticing a 7-1 singles record and finished nine and two overall. There's a lot to be proud of here on Rocky Top. I do want to specifically note our 12th ranked Lady Vols volleyball team. They're 13 and one. They have won 41 of their total 47 sets. And for the fifth time in a row, the Tennessee Lady Vols are represented in this week's SEC weekly honors. In total, that means they have 12 combined conference honors this season alone. That is pretty amazing. So guys, do we see a possible championship match in the future for our Vols? I think they definitely have the potential to do it if it all goes well. Like if there's no injuries or if everything flows, I definitely think they have potential because Coach Eve Rackham is on the rise and she just got her 100th win as a head coach, which is a big milestone. That means she's becoming a seasoned coach with more experience. And then they have potential in their players too. Morgan Fingal is the graduate student fifth year. He was everything you can ask for in a player and is in her fifth year. And she was the brightest spot, brightest player for this mm -hmm. team last season. And then they also have another fifth year outside hitter in Janasia Moore, who just eclipsed 1,000 kills, which is also a huge milestone for a volleyball player. And then they have another good young talent in redshirt freshman setter, Caroline Kerr, who has racked up several SEC Freshman of the Week honors, which I just think is incredible, and the Lady Vols are truly rolling at the right time. Well, you said it. The Lady Vols are hot right now, winning nine in a row. They're going to have four games in a row at home against SEC opponents, with it being LSU and Auburn to start the two, both on rank. They should get those wins. Next two would be ranked against Kentucky and Arkansas. But their only loss this year is up in Wisconsin against – and they're the number one team right now. Wow. And they took them to five mm -hmm. sets. So. Nice. You know, this team is a lock for the tournament, and in order to be a championship team, you got to get in. Yeah. So if they play the way they've been playing come tournament time, they mm -hmm. certainly have a chance to get to what, that championship level. I agree. Absolutely. There are going to be some great games in the future. And now, speaking of games, the attendance record for volleyball is 3,342. And I don't know about you, but I think the 12th team in the nation deserves a little bit more love than that. I've personally been to their games. They are amazing, so much fun, worth your time. And Thompson Bowling Arena is much bigger than that. So if you want to get out and see any home games, Jordan, do we have any coming up? Yes, we do. So the next home game is October 13th against Georgia. Volleyball plays at home also on October 8th, which is over fall break at LSU. So make sure to get out and support our Lady Vol sports. Thank you for watching this week's edition of Rocky Talk on Torch Sports. Next up, we've got some Maxim moments with Ellie. I'm Sophie Starkey, along with Grant and Jordan signing off this week. See you next time. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Orange Zone. I'm Jackson, that's Matt, Colton, and Zach. Let's get things started. The Orange Zone crew has moved over to the plasma so that we can discuss our predictions for the 2023 MLB postseason. Each of us has filled out a bracket and will have the opportunity to talk us through their predictions. So without further ado, Matt, get us started. Well, I want to talk about arguably the two biggest busts you could say that have happened so far. Right? We talk about the Brewers, who are the third best team, third best division winners, right? Arguably the second best division in the National League. They go down. 
along with the Tampa Bay Rays. Two teams you talk about that have really good chances and contending aspirations, right? The Rays are a team that was really disappointing. For, for one, no one showed up to their game. If you looked at the game, there were no fans in the stands. It was quite off the seat, not to mention their ballpark is horrendous. Second thing, the Brewers do what Brewers and Milwaukee sports fans do best. They lose. They stink. They trash. Okay, so you move forward with the Brewers. For some reason, they can't win one of three games against a team that was ranked third in the wild card. They got to figure the last wild card spot in the Diamondbacks. Good for the Diamondbacks. No chance against the Dodgers. We move over to the Phillies and Atlanta. This is important to note. You're talking about the two teams that have arguably the best rosters in the MLB. This is essentially the World Series here between the Braves and the Philadelphia Phillies. Two teams with great crowds, two teams that have a lot of firepower and a lot of great pitching. I have the Braves winning primarily because they are the best team in baseball and baseball history and the best team statistically on paper. So give me the Braves against the Dodgers. Now here's the thing, the Dodgers have a lot of experience, they have a lot of guys that have been there before and understand the moment. So do the Braves, okay? I think it's gonna be an excellent series. You're talking about one that can easily go six, seven games. Give me the Braves. Looking at the American League, like I said, Rays advance, they play the Orioles, the second best team in baseball, a team with a bunch of young players. This is a team that isn't so much concerned about wins, they're so concerned about going out there and having fun. How do you have fun? You do the little things right, you hit, hit hits, you get home runs, you get make great catches, right? That's the kind of team they are. They have a lot of young studs. And it translates to winning, which is why they win so many games. So give me the Orioles over the Rays. That's going to be another great, excuse me, Orioles over what's now the Texas, Texas Rangers, who are also very good contenders, a wild card team in the American League. They can beat the Orioles, but I'm taking the Orioles. Like I said up here, we got the Twins and the Astros. Astros, just a better team. Carlos Correa can't do it all for the Twins. Give me the Astros, and then we get the Astros and Rays. I had picked the Rays. Unfortunately, I was wrong. We now have the Astros and Orioles. I like the Orioles. They are the second best team in baseball. They are a young team. Give me, in the end, the Orioles and now the Braves. I'm changing my prediction just a little bit. At the end, Braves, Orioles. You got to go with the best team in baseball. I know the number one seed doesn't win most of the time, but when you're talking about a team as good as the Atlanta Braves, you can't go wrong. Give me the Atlanta Braves. All righty. Sounds good. Sounds good. Let's head on to the next pick. Who we got next? Who we got next? Who we got next? Colton, talk <laughs> us through. Yeah, I mean, like, like Matt said earlier, we did these last night. I thought the Brewers were going to be able to get both those games against the Diamondbacks. I know they lost game one, but I should have known. Going against Zach Gallon, one of the best – uh, pitchers in baseball. Diamondbacks got that win, but I think the Dodgers are just better than them in all facets. I mean, I think this could be probably the most lopsided series um, of the playoffs so far. I think the Dodgers get that one. Phillies and Braves, once again, I agree with Matt. I think this is going to be a really close series. I mean, I know the Braves, best team in baseball, by far the best hitting team in baseball, but I think the Braves pull this one out, but this one could easily go six, seven games for sure. Dodgers and Braves, I mean, I think this is the World Series, ser like, right here. I think both these teams are the two best teams in baseball. I think this goes seven games, but I'm going to lean towards the Dodgers. The Braves have a little bit of injuries on their pitching staff. I know Charlie Morton on the 15-day IL. Not sure if he's going to be ready for this series, but I'm going I'm to I'm go with the Dodgers. So a seven-game series win there for the Dodgers. Um, the Twins, they get the win against the Blue Jays in the wild card. They go up against the Astros. Um, I like the Twins a lot, but I like the Astros just a little bit more. The experience that the Astros have, guys like Jose Altuve, Justin Verlander, they picked up at the deadline. Cheaters. <laughs> they got a lot of experience. <laughs> but, yeah, so I'm going to go with the Astros there. Um, my Texas Rangers getting the win against the Rays. If we would have done this a few days ago, I would have picked the Rays to win this series. But the Rangers showed up, and they absolutely dominated the Rays in those two games. I mean, 7-1, to 4-0, to the two scores. I like the Rangers a lot in this series against the Orioles as well. They've got one of the best lineups in baseball when healthy, and they're healthy right now. They've got their bullpen has been their problem all year long, though. I mean, that could that could cause them some big problems going forward. But I like them against the Orioles. The Orioles are really young. They just lost their closer, Felix Bautista. He's out for the entire playoffs. I think the Rangers can get this one done in six or seven games, too. And then the Rangers against the Astros. Um, I just like the Astros more than probably any franchise in all of sports. But I had to put my bias down here a little <laughs> bit. Um, I, just, I just think they're the better team. I mean, I really do. The, they've, they're 9-4 and four against the Rangers so far in all the games they've played this season. Like I said, they've got more experience. The Rangers are a young team. They're up and coming. But I think the Astros get the win here six, seven games again. I think this is going to be really close. Now walk us through our, your World Series. Yeah, Astros, Dodgers, it's a close one again. But Dodgers just, I think, have more firepower. I love Freddie Freeman. I love Mookie Betts. 
Clayton Kershaw, their pitching staff is good as well. I'm going to go with the Dodgers to win the World Series. All right, there we go. Let's get Zach in here. Zach, what you got for us? So, talk us through, talk us through your, your big differences. I see you've got some similar elements, but you've got Baltimore going into the World Series instead of Houston in the last two. So I think you win 100 games in the year, you're a pretty decent team. You're going to outmatch <laughs> You're gonna outmatch the Put Texans. Put that on a T-shirt. <laughs> uh, you're gonna outmatch the Texans. Um, I have the Orioles moving on. Um, a lot of those games have already been decided, so I'm not even gonna worry about them. Uh, Twins and Astros. I mean, Astros, like you said, have been here before. Um, they've been. They know how to play. Still a little salty after that uh, last year. Them sweeping <laughs> the Yankees, but um, I digress. Uh, Astros, and then from Baltimore and Astros uh, again. Don't like the Astros, so I'm there gonna pick go. Baltimore. Now moving so over you're to picking Baltimore because you don't like the Astros. Well, I think Baltimore's the better team. I actually wrote down that I have Baltimore being a better team. But I think the experience of the Astros being there, I think that's going to give them a good game. I could see this going six or seven. Now, talk us through, talk us through your, your National League uh, championship series between the Dodgers and the Braves. So, Dodgers and Braves. I think Braves, like you said, are the best team in baseball. Um, that's what I said. I mean, what, 104 wins? You don't just get that from being – uh, you don't just get that from being the average team. You get that from being the best team in MLB. So I have the Braves moving on, facing the Orioles. And I think this is probably going to be probably the best series we've seen in a long time. No lopsided. Two of the best teams in MLB baseball. Um, I think the Orioles will get close, but not close enough. I think the Braves will take it home. I, I, I really like, I just want to hit real quick, if you don't mind. Go for it. I like your pick primarily, Colton, of Texas over the Orioles. It's a really underrated pick. Mm -hmm. Texas is an extremely good team. They could win the World Series. It's the truth. They're a wild card. They have a lot of offensive firepower. Their starting pitching rotation is excellent. Their bullpen, like you mentioned, is not great. It's probably their biggest problem. And they have a lot of lapses from time to time. And they're almost due for one, in all seriousness. But the Texas Rangers, a team that made a big splash at the deadline, have a lot of good pieces, a lot of good slugging pieces, and can easily make their way. I shouldn't say easily. Could make their way to the World Series. They have to get past a really good and young Astros team. It's funny you mentioned that. Uh, excuse me, and Orioles. Team. I actually got to make up their bracket this time. I got to actually throw my opinion oh, there. So let's in. go to mine. Look at you. Let's no way. This one. I like the Orioles. Oh. I like the Orioles a lot. Yeah. I think that you guys Jackson are sleeping Boston. on this young, amazing team. They've been bad for so long. They're due to be good. On the other side, I hate the Dodgers. I think the Dodgers Agreed. are the most boring most vanilla, most, hey, guys, we have a lot of money. Just come play for us. We're going to steal Freddy. We're going to do all that kind of stuff. I think they're the terrible. Phillies. You I the like Phillies. That's Philly's where energy. Philly's energy is immaculate. Last year we saw how crazy they get in the playoffs, and Philadelphia is not a sports city you want to play in. I like them, but I got the Orioles beating the fight in Phillies in that. And not only do I think they're going to win, but I don't think you guys appreciate the Baltimore Orioles as much as I do. So I'd like to go to the second bracket that I made it's hard that will to. really show how I feel. <laughs> now I've got the O's. Give me this hat. I got them winning it all. And I think they're going to do it. But that's all the time we have for this episode. Thank you so much for watching. And make sure to stick around for this week's edition of Pick 6. For Matt, Colton, and Zach, I'm Jackson Shock. See you next week. Peace. What's up, guys? I'm Brendan. And I'm Jay King. And it's time for our Pick 6 Games of the Week. On Instagram, we sent out polls of six of the biggest college football and NFL games. And the results are in, and some were lopsided, and some were close. Let's get into the results, starting with the NFL. There's a big game happening in London between the Buffalo Bills and the Jacksonville Jaguars, where it is the Jaguars' second straight week there. The Buffalo Bills come in as a five-and-a-half point favorite, and 78% of our followers think that the Bills will win. Brendan, who do you think will come out on top? I think this is going to be a close game. I'm going to go with Bills Mafia on this one. Yeah, I'd have to agree. Josh Allen is straight up playing like the best quarterback in the league right now. Let's, let's take out week one versus the Jets. And, I mean, he has looked unbeatable. Um, so is the entire team. Give me the Bills. All right. So I decided to roll over on the college football part. Since we're on our bye week, we decided to choose one of the college football games. This one, we have Georgia going into Kentucky for this matchup. Jay, who do you think is going to win? Yeah, um, well, I really want Kentucky to win. I feel like they have a chance. They've been playing red hot this year. Ray Davis and Devin Leary both look amazing. But, I mean, Georgia is Georgia, and it's going to be in Athens this week. Give me the Bulldogs, as much as I hate to say it. All right, well, I'm going to also go with Georgia. As bad as they might look through three quarters, I think they'll probably pull it out in the fourth quarter like they always have in the past couple weeks.
Yeah, next off in the NFL, the San Francisco 49ers will host the Dallas Cowboys on Sunday night in a huge NFC matchup. 63% of our followers think that the 49ers will win, and they are three-and-a-half point favorites. Who do you have winning? It's going to be a good one again. Might be game of the year right here, but this is going to be a defensive battle. And with the defensive battle, on paper, I'm going to go with the 49ers. They look the best. Yeah, I mean, the 49ers, again, probably the best team in the NFL. They're undefeated right now. Uh, Cowboys do look all right, but the offense is concerning. Give me the 49ers. All right, next college game, we got two teams that we're going to be facing in the future. We got Texas A&M going down to Alabama. Now, Jay, who do you think is going to win this game? Yeah, I think this game will be very close. Again, I hate Bama with all my heart. Um, it's going to be in College Station, too. So this is like the perfect, perfect spot for an upset like they did two years ago. The games have been super close lately. I'm going with Bama, though, as much as I hate to say it. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disagree with you here. I'm going to say Texas A&M. Going with Solely upset. because I would love to see, as a Vols fan, just for Alabama, to finally get their second w loss on the season. Yep. And uh, lastly, on the NFL side, we have a Monday night matchup between the Las Vegas Raiders and the Green Bay Packers in a revenge game for Devontae Adams. The Packers come in at one and a half point favorites, and 67% of the fans say that Green Bay wins. Who do you have winning? It's going to be not entirely a close one. I'm going to say Green Bay gets their bounce back win. Yeah, I think Devontae Adams is questionable right now, but if he does end up playing, he might have a big game against the Packers. Um, I want this to be an upset, but... I think the Raiders are one of the worst teams in the NFL. Give me the Packers. Interesting. Well, that'll do it for this week's episode of Pick 6 of the Week. And as always, I'm Brendan Green. And I'm Jay King. Welcome back to another episode of SportsCast. I'm Luke Lamry, and we are back in Knoxville breaking down Tennessee Vols football. Compared to last time we talked about football, the forecast is looking a lot brighter, but I'll ask you this, just how much brighter? Let's dive into it. The Vols were out for revenge this weekend, and boy, did they get it. They dominated USC with a 21-point commanding victory. Uh, let's just talk some positives here. The rushing game looked absolutely fantastic. The Vols rushed for 238 yards, and they had three different Vol running backs get in the end zone. Uh, Jalen Wright, Javari Small, and Dylan Sampson all scoring touchdowns. Uh, behind an offensive line that frankly looked just brand new. They looked absolutely just brand new, and I'll tell you why. I think it is Cooper Mays. Cooper Mays is back in the lineup. He had a hernia for like three weeks, and you ask your parents, that's not a fun one. Uh, but they just looked absolutely fantastic. He brought a whole new dynamic to the offensive line. Just, just brilliant. And I want to talk about Joe for just a second. Uh, Joe with a touchdown, two interceptions, 65% completion. He's had better games. He's had worse games. Uh, you know, we got to give him some time. Let's, let's trust in our QB. He's our QB. We j he'll have his moments, but we just got to give him some time. Uh, Squirrel White, Milton's top target, nine catches, 104 yards. Let's talk about the catch. Let's talk about the catch. First quarter, 50-yard bomb. Just an absolutely incredible adjustment from Squirrel White. He absolutely just every adjustment possible just to bring that thing right in the breadbasket. I mean, just pristine wide receiving. Uh, switching to the defense, they showed up. Plain and simple. Uh, they showed they had a pulse. Gamecocks were just 2 of 14 on third down. Uh, and, and if you're a Gamecock coach or uh, a fan, you, you just got to be embarrassed because it's just humiliating. And we absolutely hammered them. Just absolutely hammered them. Uh, James Pierce Jr., all I got to say. Five tackles, two sacks, SEC defensive lineman of the week. I mean, you try to stop him, he'll tell you. He will clean your clock. I mean, you, don't, don't, don't you even doubt James Pierce Jr. for one second. Uh, very briefly, I want to talk about Rattler. I want to talk about Rattler. I'm just going to read some numbers off the top of my head here. 160 yards, no touchdowns, and interception. Does that sound like a, a, a good line? I mean, does that, does that sound like a good stat line at all? It's, uh, it doesn't, because it's not. It's garbage, okay? That was terrible. And I, I've been trying to wrap my head around this for a couple of days now. Why is he talking? Why, I don't understand why he's talking. He, I, he gets sacked six times. Sacked six times, and his team lost by three possessions. So I don't get why he's talking. Uh, but I'll, I'll leave you with this. Um, I, I, I will admit that I was in the student section, and I, I, was, I was chanting along with everything that the students were saying, even the hateful things, and I have no regrets. 
Uh, another unfortunate thing to look at, uh, injuries sustained on Saturday. And we're going to, you know, Brew McCoy, just absolutely devastating. Gruesome to look at. Uh, fracture dislocation of his right ankle. Let's, I mean, if we're going to take a look at some positives, the surgery went successful Sunday morning. Uh, hopefully he'll be back out there next year, uh, next uh, season. I think he said he would be, which is uh, fantastic. Brew, we love you. Prayers up for you. Uh, prayers for a speedy recovery, buddy. Uh, overall, the Vols are looking a hell of a lot better than the past weeks, uh, but I think we need to fill some holes in the defense. Uh, we got to keep our guys healthy. Joe's got to hit a few more passes. Uh, but, you know, it's good we have a bye week. Our players, you know, can get some rest. And I'm excited about our O-line and running combo. I know I've already exp expressed that, but I'm frankly giddy for the rest of this season just to see what they can do. I mean, that was a, a, a fantastic, fantastic showing. Um, uh, that's about my time. Thanks for sticking with me there. Let's stay positive about our balls, guys. Okay, we've got a great team here. Let's stay positive, and we, we take for granted uh, what they do. we got to stay positive. We're going to have a great rest of the season. I'm Luke Lamry. Thank you for tuning in to SportsCast. That's all we have for you in this week's episode of Torch Sports. We'll be back next week with heated discussions and key analyses of your favorite sports teams, as well as breaking down all things Rocky Top. Make sure to follow us on our TikTok at Torch Sports and on our Instagram at Torch Sports UTK. Enjoy your fall break and as always, go Vols!